This is Mrs. Palmer Coy with the video for Unit 8 on the Special Senses. When we talk about the human senses, we can categorize them in two groups. There are the general senses, and the receptors for these senses are found throughout the body. We talked about some of these already in talking about the integumentary system, the senses that give us our uh, ideas of touch and pressure, vibration, hot and cold and pain that are in our skin. And these same sensors are found in various organs and our joints, helping us to be aware of how our body is moving or how... Um, how full our stomach is and other situations like that. And then there are the special senses, which is going to be the focus of this video. And the special senses refer to specialized receptors that are confined to structures in and around the head. In the most cases, these special senses are connected directly to a particular organ. And so they are part of our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our mouth. A general pathway for our human senses are that our sensory receptors send a message to the brain which is interpreted as a sensation and then our brain perceives what it is that we are sensing and actually projects it back so that we are um, perceiving the ear as being the source of, of the sound when really it is our brain that is doing the interpretation. So we project it back to that actual organ, even though all of the work is happening in our central nervous system. So just to give some specific information, this thinks about where the information flows if we have taken a bite of an apple. So that things go from smell, we smell the scent of the apple in our nose and it goes down the olfactory nerve fibers to the cerebral cortex where it's analyzed as a pleasant smell. And so our brain then says, oh, we are smelling an apple based on the memory that we have of previous smells of apple. Our taste bud has receptor cells and sends those messages down sensory fibers through several different nerves to the cerebral cortex again. And then we identify that as a sweet taste and drawing upon our memory of apples, our brain says we are having the taste of an apple. The rods and cones in our eyes in the retina layer at the back of the eye are firing based on the light that is bouncing into them off the apple directed into your eye. The message from those rods and cones go through your optic nerve fibers down through the midbrain and cerebral cortex to analyze the small round object as an apple. And finally, specialized cells in our ears known as hair cells in the cochlea send a message down the auditory nerve fibers again to your midbrain and cerebral cortex that analyzes that crunchy sound that you are making as you bite into an apple. And so all of these sensory organs are contributing to our experience of eating an apple. And as you can see, all of the um, sensations are going through the nervous system, through the sensory nerves, into the central nervous system for processing. There are a number of types of receptors in our sensory system. Chemoreceptors respond to changes in chemical concentrations. The pain receptors, which are also known as the nociceptors, we believe respond to chemicals that are released during some type of tissue damage, but really we do not fully understand pain. Thermoreceptors, you probably can guess, respond to changes in temperature, and we have ones that are specialized for identifying cold temperatures and ones for hot temperatures, so there's not one that does all temperature ranges. The mechanoreceptors respond to mechanical force. We talked about some of those when we're talking about their um, integumentary system and those sensors in the skin. And finally, photoreceptors respond to light. In general, the stimulation of a receptor cause, causes a potential change. We're talking electrical potential again. We ran into this already in our muscles and in the nervous system in general, so that there is a change in the membrane potential of the receptor, and either that receptor is a neuron or it is connected to a neuron so that an action potential is generated in the sensory neuron which then travels up peripheral nerves into the central nervous system, and you should be able to just picture all this happening, and all those interneurons in our brain analyze and interpret those sensory signals. 
All of our senses are capable of adaptation, which is our ability to ignore unimportant stimuli. And we've talked about this a little bit, how we don't really pay attention to the feeling of our clothing or our rings or watches because we learn to turn off or our thalamus turns off this unimportant stimuli. This leads to a decreased response to a particular stimulus and a stronger stimulus than needed to trigger the impulse of starting to pay attention to it again. The one place where adaptation does not seem to occur is in the case of the pain receptors, that the, um, in the continued um, stimuli on a pain receptor does not cause a decreased response and sometimes can actually accelerate the response, and so the pain becomes more intense or it just will not go away, even after the original cause of the pain has gone away, leading to a chronic pain situation. This is an area where there's um, some interesting research going on, looking at to how to convince the brain that, that it's not necessary to pay attention to those pain neuron circuits anymore um, to bring relief to people who are suffering from unneeded chronic pain. So let's start with our special senses by starting with a sense of smell. This is determined by your olfactory receptors, which are a chemoreceptor, so they're based on chemicals. The olfactory receptors are actually a neuron. They're a bipolar neuron. And so they have a, a protein, re particular protein in the cell membrane that is a receptor for the various chemicals that make a smell. And so when these chemicals that have to come into the nose in the gaseous form, because of course we are breathing in the gas of the atmosphere, and so in order for those chemicals to get into the nose, they have to be in a gaseous form. But then they have to dissolve in the moist liquid that is in the mucous membranes that covers the inside of our nasal cavity. And so the, in order to smell something, first the smell has to be as a gas, and then it has to be able to dissolve into the moisture inside our, no, inside our nose. The olfactory receptors are high in the nasal cavity. They are found along the nasal conche. If you remember those kind of curly bones that stick out from the ethmoid bone, um, we were looking at the bones of the, the face and the cranium. Part of the nasal septum also has the olfactory receptors. And so as the air is drawn in, it's kind of swirled around and, and uh, you know, pushed up against the sides of the nasal cavity just by the structure of the bone and so that the olfactory receptors are able to kind of taste all of the different chemicals that are in there and determine what the smells are. The olfactory receptors undergo adaptation fairly rapidly. The sense of spell drops about 50% within a second or two after stimulation for a particular smell. So that is why after you are in a place with a particular smell, you don't notice it as much. But of course, it only pertains to that smell. And so if a new smell comes into the room, you will notice the new smell. So here's an illustration of what's happening. Here is the inside, the mucous membrane inside your nasal cavity. And so coming out through those um, epithelial cells, we have the neurons that actually make up the olfactory receptors. You can see they have cilia down in the very ends, that the cell membrane is folded into many, many tiny little fingers in order to increase surface area, to have more places for those receptor proteins to be able to sample the air and see if there are any scents there. Then the neurons you'll see get traced back up through these holes in the ethmoid bone, and we call this the cribriform plate. So there's many, many, many little holes for the neurons to pass through, for the axons of the neurons to pass through. And um, then will these will come together and become the olfactory nerve that will go on to the olfactory bulb. We did see the olfactory bulb with our sheep brain dissection right there at the most anterior part of the underside of the brain. And so it's... Um, uh, where the, the region of the brain where these smells are detected is, is fairly obvious on the surface of the brain, and it's known as the olfactory bulb. 
you can see that these neurons are just, you know, tiny little threads going through all these holes. And so you can imagine that if somebody suffers some kind of injury that sort of jolts their head around, it would be possible to break these neurons. And so it is possible that somebody who has been in a car accident, for example, or some other head trauma may have a decreased sense of smell because they have had the axons break. And in many cases, this would not regrow. And so they may never be able to really smell again. Again, unfortunately, smell is very closely taste, uh, connected to tasting, and so food may not be as pleasurable if you can't smell your food. I did know someone um, many years ago who, because of a car accident, had lost her sense of smell, which made things difficult for personal hygiene because she couldn't tell if she had had enough deodorant on that morning, and it really made eating very unappealing because she couldn't taste food the way she used to. So sensory information is carried by the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one, and analyzed by the olfactory bulb that's on the inferior surface of the frontal lobe of the brain. Then moving on to taste, the taste receptors are found on taste buds, and I think you already knew that. These are also chemoreceptors, and so they respond to chemicals that are dissolved in the liquid of the saliva and the whatever other, you know, when we eat food, we're eating moist food. It's very hard to eat dry food. The taste buds can be found on the papillae of the tongue, those little bumps on your tongue. But they're also on the roof of your mouth and on the inside of your mouth, on your cheeks and the, the pharynx, the back of your mouth. And so it's not just on your tongue. You're tasting with that whole interior, interior of the oral cavity. Like the cilia on your olfactory receptors, the taste cells also have a microvilli along the edge. They're, they have taste hairs. And that this microvilli provides greater surface area so that the receptor proteins on the cell membranes can sample as much of the liquid inside the mouth and get the greatest taste uh, sensation out of the food you're eating. Unlike the olfactory receptors, though, the taste buds, the taste cells do not have a, they are not neurons, they do not have a direct line to the nerve, but the changes in the membranes because of the binding of food chemicals with proteins on the membrane then is able to trigger the neurons that are nearby to send the neural impulse message on through. So just look at the illustration here, taking a close-up of the tongue. Here's the taste bud on one of the papillae, those, that bumpy stuff all over your tongue. And then just a little bit closer, you can see here's the taste cell and the taste hair, the cilia right on the very end of that cell. There are some other supporting cells around that taste cell so that this is, um, there's many other cells making up the tongue. There's a lot of just epithelial cells, so it's not all taste cells. But the um, nerves then are being coming in together, traveling from the nearby neurons that are just right next door to the taste cells, so that the message then can go to the analyzing center of the brain. You probably know that there are five primary taste sensations. There's the taste of sweetness that's stimulated by carbohydrates, especially those simple carbohydrates, simple sugars, mono and disaccharides. There's the sour taste, which is stimulated by acids like lemon juice. There's a salty taste that's stimulated by ionic compounds, especially uh, sodium chloride, table salt. There's a bitter taste that's stimulated by a number of organic compounds. That's the flavor of coffee. There's kind of a bitterness in, in coffee. And then there's umami. And I see this N should be an M. Sorry, I misspelled it. That's an M. Which is a taste um, stimulated by amino acids so that protein foods give the, sort of that richness of a meat taste is our umami taste sensation. The actual flavor of anything depends on a combination of taste sensations along with your sense of smell contributing to your taste and that the spicy foods actually are stimulating pain receptors. So when we say something is hot, we really do mean we're, you know, we're hitting on some of our pain receptors there. The sensory impulses go down three, possibly one of three nerves. The facial nerve, nerve number seven, the glossopharyngeal nerve, nerve number eight, nine, and then nerve 10, the vagus nerve, 
all head off to the gustatory cortex, which is low in the parietal lobe. It's sort of buried in here. This is drawn on the surface, but it actually is deeper in the brain. So just to kind of see where everything is, we talked about the olfactory bulb here, which was um, as easily seen on the underside of the brain. And coming up, we'll talk about the auditory cortex, which you can see sort of sits right behind the ear because this is the temporal lobe. And so your, the temporal bone is the source where you, this place where your ear canal is. And then we have the visual cortex, I've already mentioned, is found in the occipital lobe in the back of your head. Um, and then the vestibular cortex has to do with our balance and equilibrium. And again, that's close to the temporal lobe, very close to the ears itself. So moving on to hearing, the ear is actually composed of three areas. We have the outer ear, which is made up of the oracle or that part of the ear that sticks out. Sometimes you see it referenced as the pinna, but more technically a pinna is reserved for ears that can be moved around, like many animals can kind of focus their ears. So uh, with our ears, we can't, we might be able to wiggle them, but we can't really focus them on the sound. So it's better to be called an oracle. And then you have the ceruminous glands, which produce that ear wax, which helps prevent bacterial infection. It's got an immune system function to prevent bacteria from getting a, a uh, colonization hold inside your ear canal. And then, of course, the ear canal itself, which is the place where sound waves, which is compressed air, can make its way in from the outside environment all the way down to your middle ear. Your middle ear passes on those sound waves by using the eardrum, the vibration of the eardrum, and the auditory tube, which is also called the eustachian tube, is what connects the middle ear the with the um, outside atmosphere, sort of a pressure equalizing tube. It goes into the throat, and this is when you're up in an airplane and you're feeling pressure inside your ears and you, know, you hold your nose and try to blow. What you're doing is moving air from your throat up this tube, the auditory tube or eustachian tube, into the middle ear area and equalizing the pressure. And finally, the inner ear is where we have sort of the working members that the cochlea for hearing and the utricle, saccule, and the semicircular canals all involved in balance are also called equilibrium. So just to try to talk ourselves through this process of hearing, sound waves come into our ears as compressed air or layers of compressed air, and this causes vibrations, which first are registered in the eardrum and then transferred through three very tiny bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, to another membrane found at the oval window. This vibrating membrane sets fluid vibrating, the perilymph and then the endolymph. Surrounding or being surrounded by this fluid is a series of membranes. And so the basilar membrane is vibrating because of the vibrations coming through the perilymph. And this membrane causes hair cells found in your ears as well as your other sensory organs. The hair cells get pushed against the tectorial membrane. Like in your taste buds, the hair cells are not neurons themselves but they are closely associated with neurons. And so bending the hair cells generates eventually a nervous impulse in a cranial nerve, nerve number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then these nerve impulses travel into the auditory areas of the temporal lobe, which I showed you on a previous slide. So to look at this in an illustration, here are sound waves coming in the ear canal. So we have compressed air, and then we have sort of a less, you know, more of a, a less air vacuum in between. And then here we've got a, another layer of compressed air. So like waves on the beach, we have sound waves coming in. It causes a vibration of the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And then this is connected to these three tiny bones, the malleus and the incus and the stapes, and it beats on this other membrane known as the oval window. These three bones, even though they are tiny, actually amplify the sound, and so the amount of vibration coming into the cochlea is much more than the vibration that actually hits the eardrum, and that allows us to hear very, very tiny sounds. So these little uh, arrows that we see in here are representing the frequency of different sound waves that may be hitting. 
Waves that have a high frequency, a very short wavelength, cause a vibration down on this end of the cochlear canal because this part of the basilar membrane is stiffer and stiffer materials vibrate at higher frequencies. And then those, as we move down the basilar membrane, it becomes more loose and bouncy. And so down at this other end, we have much more lower frequency or lower sounds that are registering here. So there's a, a sorting of um, sound by pitch all the way down the cochlear, the twist of the cochlear. So the um, close-up down below shows the hair cells between these two membranes and as the vibrations cause a flexing of the basilar membrane, these little hairs on the end of the hair cells are moved back and forth which causes a change in their cell membrane potential which causes a signal to be sent down these various nerve fibers that all eventually come together to become the cochlear nerve. I'm sure you can picture how louder sounds, more intense sounds, would cause a greater fluctuation of the membrane and could possibly damage these hair cells by being buffeted back and forth between the two. And so one of the you know, effects of very, very loud sounds is at least a temporary loss of function in these hair cells. And if it continues on over a lifetime, you can suffer permanent damage, and those hair cells then would no longer be able to register the sounds, causing deafness. The other special sense that is handled by your ear is the sense of balance, or equilibrium. There are two different types of equilibrium. There is static equilibrium, which happens when your body is not moving, but your head is. And then dynamic equilibrium when you're having the whole head and body move, as um, not just the head by itself. There are different parts of the ear, the inner ear, that are involved in these two different types of equilibrium sensing. In static equilibrium, the part called the vestibule and it is made up of two different sacs, the utricle and the saccule, that they are sensing the position of the head when the body is not moving by the movement of calcium carbonate rocks called otoliths. So you have rocks in your head, you have rocks in your ears. They're suspended in a kind of a gelatinous fluid, so it's not loose like water. It's got some substance to it. But as you tip your head, these rocks shift position. They land on hair cells and are triggering nerve impulses that send information back to the brain about how the head is positioned. You know, where are you? How are you turning it? Is it looking up or down or side to side? And so this vestibule, these two parts of the vestibule are involved in just head motion by itself. But when the rest of the body is moving, the semicircular canals are what are giving you the sense of where your body is in space, how fast you are rotating, uh, your ability to not feel dizzy. Those come from the dynamic equilibrium part of your inner ear. The semicircular canals are fluid-filled ovals that are oriented in three planes. So they are as X and Y and then as Z. So just like your um, planes that you've probably worked with in math, you have these three orientations for your inner ear semicircular canals. They the fluid then is moving at a different rate rate of acceleration than the rest of the body and so this difference between the fluids movement and the bone movement as the as your body or head moves is what is triggering the impulse on the hair cells because of the pressure of the fluid and that goes on to again be reported to the brain and the brain interprets the sensation. I have a picture to try to show this a little bit better on the next slide. But along with the semicircular canals when it comes to dynamic equilibrium, we also have mechanoreceptors, which can be called proprioceptors, in your joints, which help you know where parts of your body are is in space without having to look at it. So a sense of where your foot is, where your knee is without looking. And you also have visual cues that tell you where you are um, so that if you are suffering from a disorder that affects your semicircular canals, you still, by moving very slowly, can function based just on those visual cues. So this picture, here's a, a 
diagram a dissection of this part of the inner ear. So here's your cochlea. This is this two and a half turns of um, bone where filled with fluid where the sound waves are, are traveling down there and causing vibrations in the bacillar membrane and sending messages down the nerve here with concerning what you are hearing. But then you have in the three planes of the body, you have these semicircular canals you can see kind of roughly drawn out here. And this little lumpy part at the bottom is where you have the, it's called the ampullae, you've got your hair cells are down here. They're sitting in a kind of a gelatinous sac and then the fluid in the rest of the semicircular canal is much more loose. It's able to move a lot more easily and then it bumps up against this sort of gel capsule. So this is a larger drawing that is showing what this ampule looks like. Here is your sensory hair cells down below and then they're sort of surrounded by this gelatinous area. So as a person turns their head the fluid then is going to shift and it will push against this um, gelatinous material, the endolymph, and it will bend the hair cells here at the um, ampullae of the, the semicircular canal, and so then that sends an impulse down the nerves. If you ever have watched gymnastics and you watch somebody doing a tumbling run, and you know, just kind of diagram here, they're going to, they flip and they turn and they turn and they bounce, and they usually do something in the other direction before they stop all the way. And this reverse at the end is to sort of settle down the fluid in your semicircular canal so that they can stick that landing and not be as dizzy because the fluid has been rotating in one direction and it would keep on rotating in that direction if they just stopped here at the very end. But by doing this one flip back the other way, then it kind of, uh, you know, makes things at least a little less swirly in the inner ear. And so a person is more likely to be able to stick the landing without feeling quite so dizzy. And then finally, moving on to the special sense of vision. The eye has both receptors for vision and a refracting system that allows that senses the information coming in to be focused so that we can actually see whatever image uh, you're looking at. There are several accessory structures that also help with vision. Your eyelid provides protection and it provides a way of sort of sweeping fluid across the eye to keep it lubricated and clean. The tears are produced by the lacrimal, lacrimal glands, which are actually located up here on the outside of your eye. And so tear is flowing across your eye in this direction, heading for the drainage holes um, in the, the what we call the tear ducts. But actually tears are not coming out of those ducts. Tears are going into those ducts and down to be draining into the nasal cavity. So if you're crying a lot and it makes your nose run, actually it's because your tears are ending up in your nasal cavity. But having the tears go across the eye, again, keeps it clean. The tears also contain lysozyme, which is an antibiotic. It helps prevent bacterial infection. So you're constantly, by blinking your eyelids, you're constantly kind of washing them down, keeping them clean by moving those tears, which are produced constantly, moving them across the eye itself. The eyeball is able to converge on an object to focus on it because you have six muscles that are able to move in the kind of adjust all of the directions of the eyeball. So this diagrams, you know, we've got the muscles that are going, move your eye up and down and to the one side and to the other side and then also a turning motion. You can roll your eyes and so these muscles don't work individually so much as all together to make the eye look and focus in the way that that it needs to to see things and you know you can move your eyes in many directions. Because there are these six or three pairs of muscles, there are three distinct nerves that are controlling each pair, and things won't get confused there by the nervous system. So the oculomotor nerve number three and the trochlear nerve four and the abducens nerve six are all involved in the eye movement through these extrinsic muscles. The eyeball itself is a hollow sphere with three layers in the outer wall. 
The outer layer is known as the sclera, and that's the white connective tissue. And actually, the sclera is uh, contiguous with the eyelid. So if I, you know, just kind of draw an eyelid here, and then we're going into the eyeball, this um, epithelial layer, layer on the underside of your eyelid, this is my lashes here, connects up with the sclera. So it is not possible, if you are a person who wears contact lenses, you know, it is not possible to lose your contact lens. It can slide up into this deep corner of your eye, but it cannot go behind your eyeball because there is a barrier there. So the sclera does curve around and it becomes the epithelial cells on the inside of your eyelid. And then there's a middle layer, a choroid layer, a rich in blood vessel layer. It contains, along with the blood vessels, it contains a pigment, a dark blue pigment that helps absorb light inside the eye so you don't have a lot of light reflecting and bouncing around and making it difficult for you to see. The choroid layer also contains the ciliary body, which is the muscle connected to the lens that helps you focus, and then the iris itself, which is the colored part of the eye. And then the inner layer is the retina and has those specialized cells, the rods and the cones, which allow us to see things. The eyeball also contains two cavities. We have an anterior cavity between the cornea, which is the outermost layer of the eyeball, and the lens. And this, the anterior cavity can contains a liquid known as the aqueous humor, a very uh, watery liquid that provides nutrients to the cells of the cornea and the lens. There are not many organelles in those cells so that the light can pass freely through the um, cell to get to the inside of the eye. If there were mitochondria and you know other organelles there absorbing light, um, we would not be able to see as well. So we did need to get nutrients provided by being bathed in nutritious fluid. So the aqueous humor is that fluid. And then in the posterior cavity, we have a gelatinous, vitreous humor, more jelly-like humor that basically pushes the retina against the outside of the or the inside of the eyeball and keeps it in place. So here's a larger diagram. We can see our three layers: the sclera on the outside, the choroid layer in between, and then the retina on the most inside layer. If we go to the anterior portion here of the eyeball, you can see here's the lens, and it's attached to the ciliary body um, and through a series of ligaments so that the lens itself can be pulled um, more towards the outside or relaxed and, and um, take on a different shape. This helps, helps us focus how the lens is being pulled by the muscles. The cornea is this most outermost layer, the very first um, layer of cells on the clear portion of the sclera where the light comes in. The pupil, of course, is just a hole allowing a way for light to enter into the eyeball. Aqueous humor being the fluid that fills this part of the anterior cavity. If a person suffers from glaucoma, too much aqueous humor is being produced. It's not able to drain away. And so pressure increases in the anterior cavity, which puts pressure on the posterior cavity, which then can cause damage to the cells on the retina just by the fact that they are being shoved and pushed by the pressure coming from the front. The um, All of the Neural information goes down the optic nerve here at the back of the eyeball, but it's not straight back from your eye. What is straight back from the pupil is the fovea, and this is the center of your visual field. This is where you have the most cones concentrated. This is where you see the sharpest vision, and so it is directly back from the pupil. The optical nerve is actually a blind, or the optic nerve is a blind spot because it's where all the neurons are coming in. All those axons are are passing through one point and there's no room to have any rod or cone cells and so you have a blind spot in your eye and so it is in a slightly different place on both eyeballs because it's sort of offset slightly to the center so that we don't notice this blind spot until you do there's a couple different activities that you can do to actually see that there's a place where you don't see anything from one eye but your other eye compensates it and your brain just puts the images together
I like this diagram because it actually gives you a sense that there are sort of these sections of membranes inside the posterior cavity. It's not just filled with gel, but it's sort of sectioned off like an orange with membranes. And unfortunately, I know this from personal experience that these membranes can break. Um, in my left eye, I had a posterior vitreous detachment about three years ago. And so this membrane has detached from the back of my retina, and it's just sort of floating here in the middle of my eye, getting in the way of the light rays coming in. As you can imagine, I'm, it's, if you've ever had floaters in your eye, it's worse than floaters, but it's just sort of this blurry um, vision-impeding patch that I have constantly in my left eye, Hopefully my right eye will not follow suit because that would just be very difficult to see things, um, very frustrating. But right now I, I'm more right eye than left eyed. So I like this diagram because it actually admits there are membranes in there. It's not just filled with jello, and unfortunately those membranes can detach. It's not life-threatening, but it's just kind of annoying. To focus on the image, we have light that is coming into the pupil that has to be put on a focal plane, just like you're focusing a projector or a camera or a microscope. The information is coming in from the light, but it has to be focused down to the point where you can see what's happening. So light is being refracted, it's being bent towards the retina as it moves through the cornea and through the lens, and the ciliary body changes the shape of the lens as you look at something close or far away. When things are coming from far away, light rays are re relatively parallel coming into the eye, and so they're kind of set up and uh, very easily bent to focus on the focal plane back here on the retina. The um, ciliary body then... Um, doesn't have to uh, work so hard. They don't have the muscles can be relaxed, and so distance viewing is something that's relaxing to your eye. But close viewing, when you have you're looking at something very close, the light rays have not had a chance to become parallel, so they're coming in at an angle, and you have to change the shape of the lens to focus things on this back retina. So near vision is more work for your eye. Your ciliary muscle is contracted. The lens is, is being made uh, more rounded in order to have a thicker lens and be able to bend those light rays more. You may have heard that if you're working on the computer, it's going every 30 minutes to take a break and to look at the distance and that is so that your eye your lens in your eye and your ciliary muscles can have a chance to just relax and not have to focus so hard on a close distance so it is a you know true thing there's a physiological reason behind why that recommendation is made and it's so that your lens or the muscles that are connected to your lens can get a break every once in a while Incidentally, the image as projected on the retina is upside down and reverse left to right. And this has to do with light rays and the focal points. If you ever take physics, you would be playing around with this a little bit on your optics lessons. So in the retina, we have our rods and our cone cells. And these are the specialized cells that are our sensory receptors for vision. The rods, and this is the shape, the, the rods are more square shaped, the cones are more Christmas tree shape. So the rods are much, much more sensitive to light, but they don't see color. They're black and white sensors, but they can see in dim light. And they respond to the presence of light by breaking down a chemical known as rhodopsin. And the breakdown of rhodopsin generates an electrical impulse, which then gets transferred to the nearby neuron and sent off to the optic nerve. Rhodopsin is built from vitamin A, and so that's why carrots are good for night vision. If you've got a good supply of vitamin A in your body, then you'll be able to rebuild the rhodopsin every time you break it down when you're experiencing uh, light. The cones, the cone cells, provide much sharper images in living color, and they are found primarily towards the center of the retina, whereas the rods are found more towards the periphery. There are three different types of cone cells, and so there's only three wavelengths of light that we analyze that are then put together to generate all of the variety of colors. 
the light waves of red, blue, and green somehow generate electrical impulses in those cone cells which gets transferred onto the nerves. And it's this combination of these three colors. How many red cones are firing compared to how many blue cones or how many green cones? And so those are added together to make all the many colors that we are able to perceive with our brain. The neurons eventually converge at the optic disc to become the optic optic nerve, and we had a good picture of that big, thick optic nerve in our brain dissection. Interestingly, here's our rods and cones. They're the last thing in the retina. They're not the outside layer. The light has to make its way through the, the neuron ends, um, the, the axons, and the various you know, bipolar neurons that are sitting in front of the rods and cones before that light ever gets to a sensory cell. So the sensory cells are not on the first layer of the surface. They're kind of buried back in the retina. The, um, down here I have a picture that shows the shape of the cone. As I said, a little more Christmas tree looking, whereas the rods were more straight up and down. And then these little discs here are the pigments that are responding to the light coming in. They're just stacked up in specialized discs. There's actually a cell membrane, all of these cells that have just sort of been peeled off in this diagram to let you see those discs. If you are someone that wears glasses or you know someone who wears, wears glasses, it's because they have a problem with refraction. Refraction is how the light is bent coming into the eye, and generally the problem is that the eyeball is a slightly different shape. The picture here doesn't really show it, but in someone who's nearsighted, your eyeball it probably looks more like a football than the nice round ping pong ball, so that the... the um, the end of the focal plane is, you know, this is where the sharp image is. These light rays continue on, so an image is put on the retina, but it's out of focus. It's past the focal plane, but it's really because the eye is more oblonged, and then farsighted, of course, the eye would then be shortened up and be more squashed. So the, the reason is li less likely to be any problem in the cornea or the lens. It's more likely to be a problem in the shape of the eyeball. Again, since I'm nearsighted, this is a very personal concern for me. Um, retinal dis detachment, actually the retina, you know, breaking down and coming off the back of the eyeball is a much greater risk for someone who is as nearsighted as I am. And again, that supports this idea that the eyeball is more elongated and everything is just really sort of stretched in there. So if you have a refraction disorder, the focal plane and nearsightedness, it's falling before the retina. And farsightedness, it's actually back there behind the eyeball, and so you're getting an image on the screen before its focal point. And so a lens put in front just bends the light rays enough that when they then go through the cornea and the lens of the eye, the focal plane will line up right on the retina. So you want these light you know, the light rays coming in to be precisely in focus for the image when it hits the retina, and then it's the various rods and cones as they fire. All of that sensory information goes into the brain, and your brain interprets that to tell you what you are seeing. Pretty amazing if you think about it. Another interesting thing about vision is that we have a sense of 3D, three-dimensional or binocular vision. And this is done, or this is accomplished, by both right um, fields of vision from, there's a, there's a right field of vision from your right eye and from your left eye, and both of those are sent then to the same side of the brain. So if you follow the colors here, you know, our right field of vision, what the right eye and what the left eye is seeing as it moves down the optic nerve and goes through sort of this crisscross part called the optic chiasm. Everything from the right field of vision from either eye all ends up over here on the left side of the brain. So we do have a crossover, but you can see we've got a pink line from both optic nerves coming together here. And the same thing is true with the gray lines going over from the left field of vision. So this allows our brain to interpret the slightly different um, information coming in from the right eye and the left eye on the right side of vision that gives us depth perception and allows us to see things as 3D and not flat 2D images. 
but it's because of how these neural circuits are arranged and how then all the images from one field, whether it's coming for, from both eyes, always goes to the same side of the brain. So that covers the, inter the overview I wanted to give you for the special senses. There's a lot that I could have said that I did not, that you'll just have to go and research on your own.